What is a living sacrifice? And what does Paul mean by it? That's what we're going to talk about today in Romans 12. We are three-fourths of the way through Romans, and boy, it has been a tough book for sure. Paul is (laughs) mind-blowing. People have been studying his writings for 2,000 years, and we still fight about sometimes what it means. He starts off saying that he appeals to us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is spiritual worship, and not to be conformed by the world. When you conform, you, you fall in place with, you align yourself with. I mean, you think about like if you sit on a very squishy couch, the couch conforms to the shape of your body. You know, it's, so that's kind of what it means. But instead that we should be transformed by the renewal of our mind, that we may be tested to discern the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we are supposed to not go and take on whatever it is that the world has told us to take on. Reminds me of the, the seed analogy that Jesus talked about, that some of the seeds get thrown into the dry, hard rock, and some of the seeds get thrown in among the thorns. They grow, but then they're kind of pinched off. People who get themselves conformed to the way of the world, they are the seeds that are thrown into those thorny uh, bushes because they can grow a little bit, and then the thorny bushes just prevent them from growing anymore. When you conform yourself into the world, that's what's happening. And so he's saying, don't do that. And by saying that he wants our body to be a living sacrifice, meaning that when we have a sacrifice, like in the temple, people would bring sacrifices to the temple for the people's sin. In this case, he says, sacrifice is going to be in your living, into your living this new life and living in this new spirit, but in this renewal, this transformation, that we have God's mercy. So we're not going to be a dead sacrifice. We're going to be a living sacrifice. But that also means that when you sacrifice, you're giving everything to God, giving yourself to God. Like I said, another hard comment, but he writes these messages that, again, are trying to teach this very young church how to take that next step. Again, when Jesus was talking to people, he was talking in one way, and now Paul is taking it up a level, trying to get them to understand what exactly it means when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, or Jesus told us we had to forgive our brothers, or when Jesus told us the purpose of the Sabbath is for people, not so that we can show off. What did all this mean? And now Paul is wrapping all this up and and sewing it up for us so that we understand it better. And so he says that grace is given to me and that no one should think more highly of themselves than they ought. That's ESV. But people get prideful. So it's, it's just like this terrible conundrum. So we can sin, sin, sin. And so someone thinks, well, I'm so super good looking. Look at me. I'm very proud of myself in all my sinning. But even when we don't sin and we try to follow God's law and then we're saying, look at me, I work very hard towards being the perfect image of God. Even when we think we're doing the wrong thing, we're thinking of doing the right thing, that is when we start going down the wrong path anyway. So even when we do the right thing, we can get into that part where we don't realize this is the gift from God. This is something that was given to us from God. All our talents, all our skills, all of it is gifts from God. And think about, like I said, that, that rock star who was living the life of sin. How good looking she is, how she's attracted herself to many other people. But it was in the end God who gave her good looks or gave her her singing ability as a gift. And she's taking credit for something that is a gift. She didn't produce her own vocal cords, right? She was born with those vocal cords and it was given to her as a gift, which she's currently using as a way of getting sin. So by turning in and saying that we think of ourselves more highly than we should, it feels to me like pride just leads to every other sin. If I'm proud, I don't need God. I I can forgive myself or I don't need forgiveness because I'm awesome. Or it can lead us into these other sins. He mentions slothfulness and zeal. We, we, we should be feverant and serve the Lord and be hopeful and, and be patient. When, when bad things happen to us, be constant in prayer. He's telling us how we should live. It is difficult for us to do that, but these are the ways that we're going to 
keep in contact with God, to keep that connection with it, because we're not going to go pridefulness. We're not going to become slothful. We're not going to get lazy. But instead, we're going to continue to recognize that God has given us gifts, each of us different gifts. I am clearly the gift of talking and not writing. I really don't like writing and I'm not very good at it. So I take that gift of talking very seriously. That's why I wanted to do this podcast, because I wanted to do something that felt in line with my gifts. And he says, whether it's prophecy, whether it's anything, any gift that we've been given, that we should be generous, be in proportion, be done in mercy and in cheerfulness. He's calling us back no matter what we have when it comes to gifts. We should be using them in that way. And he says that we should bless those who persecute us. Jesus said the same thing. We don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. We should celebrate and weep with those who are weak. We need to be empathetic, compassionate, living in harmony. Don't be haughty. But it's a associate with the lowly. If we think of ourselves, talked about the rock star who is very happy with her sinful life, going to hang around people we think are below us. So the idea is not that you should hang around people who are below you, but that you should never think of anyone as below you, right? <laughs> Take it a step backwards there. It's one of the things that people talked about in World War II about how when people got called up for World War II, they were rich, they were poor, they were teachers, they were industrialists, they were factory workers, they were everything, and they got to know each other. Don't think of anyone as lowly. Don't think of yourself as wise, but instead you're going to just be with people and not get too caught up in your own image. And I like this one too. It says, repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Or in NIV, Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This passage is such a strong message. As much as it's up to you, live in peace with everyone. I love that passage. I know that on the Robertson family, the Duck Dynasty people, Phil Robertson talks about that passage that we should always try as much as it has to do with us to live in peace with everyone. And I always wonder about that, you know, because I see a lot of people and Christians, too, who get on the Internet and just pick fights with people. Is that standing up for the Lord or is that just creating wars? I don't know the answer to that. To me, I would rather live in harmony with everyone and not be haughty and try to live peaceably with all. It doesn't mean I'm not going to tell the truth of Jesus, but that means I'm going to do what I can, as much as it depends on me, to live in that peace. And never avenge yourself, but leave wrath to God. It is not for us to get wrath. And he comes into the next line, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And he says that instead, what we do is if our enemy is hungry, we should feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. It says that by doing this, you're going to heap burning coals on his head, which I think means that if you give your enemy food and water, it's going to burn because they're going to be mad because they hate you and they're angry with you. And look at this. You're being kind to them. You're repaying evil with good. Now, that gets into a complicated situation. What do we do We have to fight a war to save other people. Let's say it's a righteous war and we've decided that it is to bring people to justice. It is to bring end to human suffering that is happening right at that moment. How is that not repaying them with evil? So I think there's a difference between vengeance and there's a difference between a war that saves other people, that brings people to justice that prevents this thing from happening again. And we have to be very careful about it. That's why in the Christian realm, we talk a great deal about it being, I don't want to say a good war, but a war that is done in the right way. God doesn't wish us to be at war at all, but he certainly is for us protecting other people. He is certainly for justice. And so this whole thing gets really complicated, but he's said that that cutoff line in all of this is revenge, vengeance, anger, wrath. 
That's not what we're looking for. We are looking for justice. Not my place to call a war a good war or a bad war, but you can see how we have that conflict within us. And then the next passage is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. I have this hanging on the wall over my bed. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I am a firm believer in that. I feel that that is exactly what God calls us to do. And so when I find in myself my anger rising, my vengeance rising, my wanting to brush something off or someone off, I realize that we don't overcome evil with evil, but instead we overcome it with good. So that is the one message I always keep in my head. It is my favorite passage in the Bible. And that ends chapter 13. What I'm going to meditate on this week is that God calls us to be in. Again, where we're not going for wrath, we're not going for vengeance, we're not going to have a life of sin, live in a life of constant battle and fighting, but instead we're going to try to give evil good. We're going to try to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, and we're going to try to live in harmony with everybody. And the most important thing that we can do to have all of that happen is to make sure that we keep haughtiness, pridefulness at bay, that we never go down that path. And what I'm going to pray about is that God always prevents me from getting that level of haughtiness, pridefulness. When I think about it, and I have to always think about it, is that whenever I'm on the internet and someone says, be proud of yourself. I saw like a meme on the internet tonight that says, Get so proud of yourself, no one could ever tear you down. Proud? What kind of pride are we talking about here? You know, am I proud about the work I do? Am I proud about who I am? Am I haughty? Am I prideful? That is what I pray that God prevents me from ever going into that direction. And what I'm going to tell others is the fact that we are supposed to live at peace with everyone and Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe, tell a friend, and remember to pray for me. And I pray for you too. I hope that we as a community pray for each other. It's one of the most important things that we can do for anyone, really, as our Christian brothers and sisters, or people who maybe aren't Christians in our brothers and sisters listening to this and other podcasts but instead are trying to figure out what is it that Christianity really means. Have a great day.